I can do this.
together with her brothers, Kenny and Harold, both of blessed memory. She grew up during some of the most challenging years in our nation's history. Her brothers, both athletes, would include their sis as they would play baseball and other sports with her. Kenny dubbing his sister and her athletic abilities as the sneaky little lefty. Jan, Kenny, and Harold were extremely close, both in their youth and teen years, but especially throughout their adult years. She was a serious student. She took great pride in her academic achievements. She knew solid her state capitals and all the U.S. presidents, and she was always sharp when it came to spelling and understanding the definition of words. As her son-in-law, Scott, explained to me, Jan could have been anything. She could have done anything and been anything had she been born at a different time and had other opportunities been available. Scott, you said that she could have done anything. Now, following Jan's graduation from John Adams High School, she worked briefly as a legal secretary. Many years ago, 10 years ago, we gathered here at this very spot. And prior to meeting at this spot, I met with Jan and her children and her family. And in her own words, she told me about how she first met a young man who would become quite important in her life. Here's what Jan told me 10 years ago. She said that at John Adams High School, Mitch, was on both the football and the wrestling teams. And one of the highlights of the high school football season was the football awards banquet. And so when Mitch was in 10th grade, he asked a young lady, a classmate of his, to accompany him as his date to the football banquet. And that young lady was Jan Schickler. They went out again on New Year's Eve, 1948 to 49. And after that evening, Neither Jan nor Mitch desired to date anyone else. Jan shared with me and reminded her family that they were high school sweethearts and they were certainly meant for each other, what we might call each other's beshirt. She said to me, and I'm quoting her, he was my one and only. After high school, Mitch went on to study at the Ohio State University for one year and then spent the next three years at Kent State University. And in 1954, Mitch's last year at Kent, he and Jan were married at Community Temple by Rabbi Jack Herman. Jan shared with me that as a couple, they just loved spending time together. They loved dancing. They were especially good when it came to doing the jitterbug. And they just loved to be on the dance floor together, and they were known as an exquisite dancing couple. Jan also told me that they were an athletic couple. They enjoyed roller skating, skiing, tennis, and she told me that for over 30 years, she and her beloved Mitch played tennis with a group that was simply known as the Tennis Club. These tennis club friends were friends not just on the court, but beyond the court. Jan and Mitch would socialize and enjoy these tennis club friends, and they had many circles of friends. They were blessed with so many good and loyal friends, and Jan said that with some of these friends, they would even vacation. And then, of course, we know that for Jan and Mitch, the highlight, one of the many highlights, but of course, a highlight of their married life together, their 57 years together, was when you two, Laura and Brian, when you entered into the world, your mom and your dad's world became all the more complete. And then when you blessed them with beautiful grandchildren, their world began to grow even more richer and more blessed. So we know that for nearly six decades, for 57 years, Jan and Mitch, they found each other's rhythm. They understood their rhythm. He worked diligently outside of the home six, sometimes seven days a week. And Jan worked diligently in the home, as the homemaker, making sure that everything ran perfectly, caring for the home, handling all the family finances, making each and every one of the social and travel plans, just running her household 
flawlessly. As I mentioned, she was blessed with a great group of friends. From her youth and teen years, she had lifelong friends. Perhaps some of you are schoolmates of Jan's. And Mitch and Jan, who made their home on Bellingham and Mayfield Heights, their neighbors on Bellingham, proved to be some of their closest friends. And of course, those tennis friends, who they rely on for so many wonderful times and so much wonderful travel. Now, when the kids were a little bit older, when Laura and Brian were maybe in their teens, Mitch decided to close his car wash. And Mitch and Jan together decided to do something quite bold. They went and purchased an ice cream franchise. Do any, any of you remember that? They bought Bressler's Ice Cream, which was located, I believe, at Euclid Square Mall. Jan was really the one who ran the shop. She ran the ice cream shop for close to eight years. And while Laura was already off at college, Brian, you were the lucky one who got to scoop ice cream side by side with your mom. But you took it all in, Brian, and you saw somebody who knew how to run a business. She had great customer service, and you also marveled at how she learned how to beautifully decorate all those ice cream cakes. She really had a skill for that. And even when the ice cream business was in the family history books, Jan's delicious creativity continued. And an example of this could be found in her eagerness to finesse an old family cookie recipe. Who was the aunt who originated the recipe? Lily. Aunt Lily's recipe. I saw pictures of this, friends, and if you've never tasted it, I actually threw the pictures filled as if I was tasting it. We all have. You all have. So you know about the wave cookie, right? We called it the wave cookie. And this is the cookie that Jan would make. She would start off by bringing this to any shiva house, maybe a bridal shower, any family gathering. She would roll out that sugar cookie dough, paper thin, lay it on the oven rack, and let it bake at the exact perfect amount of time. And these beautiful little wave cookies were created. Well, the wave cookies got a little bit popular, maybe a little bit too popular, because she was requested to, to, to have people wanted to buy them. They wanted to purchase them, and so they did. People purchased her wave cookies for their holidays and their special occasions. And sometimes there was this little coffee shop at Beachwood Place, which would also sell the wave cookies in those little bags with the ribbon. She was quite famous. Maybe not, maybe not famous Amos, but... <laughs> but she made her mark with those beautiful cookies. Friends, in the, in the last 10 years since Mitch's passing, Jan decided to turn her efforts to what we call tikkun olam, repairing the world. And while we live in a world right now that we all know is so very broken, and no one single person can heal the entire world, Jan did her work, and it meant a lot to her. She dedicated herself to many volunteer efforts, and it brought her so much satisfaction especially in the Cleveland Public Schools, where she would make her weekly visits to help students who had reading challenges. She impacted the future, I'm certain, of hundreds and hundreds of students. There were times when she would go to the Shaker Heights Elementary School, where her sister-in-law, Omi, was an art teacher, and she would help Omi on occasion in these rooms as well. She seemed to be drawn to helping children. And in Mitch's last years, Jan went, not once a week, not every few days, but every single day. And she would spend the entire day by Mitch's side, caring for him, never leaving his side, and also never wanting any recognition for this. She was very humble. I remember at the time of your dad's funeral, there was no mention of the hero, of the boots and the shama your mom was, of the loving partner that she was for your dad through all the healthiest of years and through the most challenging years. But today, since we won't embarrass her by saying it, we say today that she was a light, an example to everyone who saw the kind of care that she gave to your father and to your grandfather. Her children remember her in so many ways. They remember a mom who was independent, a mom who sometimes surprised you with her independence. And she surprised you by oftentimes stepping out of what you thought was her comfort zone. She was brave in her own special way. She had her own way of doing things. She was incredibly organized. When it came to holidays, she would lay 
table each serving dish. She had place settings with everyone's name. She set a beautiful, a perfect table. And each dish was made according to a specific annotated recipe, all in her beautiful handwriting. When she was 50 years old, she decided to take up swimming at the JCC. She never learned as a child, and she was always afraid of the water, again, stepping out of that comfort, comfort zone. And so she learned to swim. And well into her 80s, she enjoyed the exercise classes that were offered where she lived. She had notes and organizing tools for every occasion, whether it was the notes for the babysitters, the phone numbers, what the name of the theater or the restaurant where mom and dad were, all the directions for the police and fire station, the nearest aunt or uncle, she took care of everything. And she took beautiful care of herself. No matter what, she always looked put together. Her hair, her makeup, her clothes, all perfect. She had great taste and it was very important to her to always look like she was ready to take on the day. Her children said that without a doubt, mom lived to take care of her family. In her younger years, she helped raise Kenny and Harold. And as the years went on, there's a lot of people here, especially children and grandchildren, who were the recipients of articles that she would clip from the plane dealer, sometimes to the children about the dangers of smoking, sometimes articles to Lauren Leslie about gardening or homemaking, sometimes articles for the children to read about raising children. Of course, there were recipes. And there were also articles that she would send to Brian and Scott as well about running a business or making cabinets. She did this all from a place of love. Laura and Brian, I'm going to read exactly what you wrote. Laura said, Mom always put our needs first, and there was always breakfast when we woke up. She packed lunches, ready to go, snacks after school and dinner when Dad got home. She never missed a chance to make things a little better, a little more perfect. And she wanted my life or our lives to be as cool and wonderful as possible. She said, we went on to say it wasn't always easy, but Mom taught me how to create a loving home. And when I take up dinner for my family, it's as if Mom is with me making sure that it all comes out just right. And Brian, you said that mom always put so much care into everything she did. Every few weeks when I would help her set up for mahjong, everything from the chairs to the teacups, it had to be placed just so. It drove me a little crazy, said Brian. <laughs> but when I look at my successes, I realize that getting each detail just so is exactly why things have worked out so well for my business and for all of my hobbies. Her children continue to share that mom was a caregiver, and we all know that, we understand it, and those of you who knew her so well saw it. The children wrote that everyone in mom's life got what was taken care of, that she made sure of it, and when, when Mitch got sick, mom spent every day with him. The staff at Monet Fior knew mom was in charge. She said when she came down the hall, everybody out of the way. They knew not to get in her way. And years later, you said that the rabbi remembered her and left a nice note when he came to see her towards the end. The grandchildren could share hours and hours of stories about life with their grandma. But I'll share this with you. Hillary, you recalled your 10th birthday when grandma took you to Great Lakes Mall for a girl's day out. Now, for Grandma and Hillary, a girl's day out meant two completely different things. Hillary might have been a little bit more of a tomboy, and a girl's day out for her meant having fun running around the park. But for Grandma, this meant taking Hillary shopping and having a lovely ladies' lunch. <laughs> and when Hillary and Tyler would sleep over Grandma's, they remember that she always had an itinerary. It wasn't just a free-for-all. The meals were planned, even the bedtime book was planned, visits to the art museum, time in the park, Grandma always had a plan. And Tyler, who at home somehow got away with eating every sugary cereal imagined, I think Captain Crunch was one of the favorites, but when he would go to Grandma's house, she would only allow him raisin bran. <laughs> she was definitely more health conscious, conscious than Tyler's parents, but I'm told that to this day, his favorite cereal is Raisin Bran. <laughs> Emily remembers sitting on the kitchen floor with Grandma at a very early age, learning
in the alphabet with those magnetic alphabet letters. Remember those little letters we would stick on the refrigerator? Well, Emily has memories of this, learning the alphabet with her grandmother, and she remembers grandma making dual ring lunches, which consisted of carefully cut, cut strips of cheese, of salami, and of assorted fruits and veggies. And no wonder Emily loves making charcuterie trays for her and Alex and all of their friends. And Emily, in these last few years, Grandma, we get so excited to talk with you on the phone and hear all about your life's details and everything you were doing in life. And Ben remembers Grandma visiting Baltimore. She would always bring the dog, Rufus, a giant rawhide bone, so Rufus also liked Grandma. Ben remembers playing the marble game with Grandma, how much fun it was, and how she had those instructions neatly written out in case somebody forgot the rules or somebody else, usually Pampa, tried to cheat. And Grandma's the one who came up with Ben's nickname, Butchie Boy, because Benjamin, she thought, was too big of a name for such a cute little baby. And we think that maybe Grandma could see into the future because Butchie Boy became a professional butcher. So she must have known something. Scott, you and Jan, you shared the same birthday, September 23rd. And you would remind her always, every year, that this is also the same birthday as Bruce Springsteen, who she really didn't seem to know who it was, but she knew it was important to you. Your goal was always to make her laugh. This was an important thing for you, Scott. And you wanted to make her laugh because you saw somebody who was so regimented, so organized, right? But you would always cause her to break into laughter. And for you, it felt like a win. And after so many years, you realized that she would always let herself smile and laugh because she really knew how much joy it brought you. But Scott, you won her over. And part of the reason you won her over is not just because of your sweetness, because she also knew how much you love and adore Laura. Leslie, you saw a mother-in-law who was really more of another mother. She accepted you as a daughter, and you said she accepted me from day one. There was never a question. You described her as loving and meticulous, so we decided to call it lovingly meticulous. You knew her as someone who was always supportive, and while you were certainly close with her over all those years, it was really in the more recent years and months that you developed a new appreciation for each other, a new kind of friendship and a new kind of love. Because you were the one being in town, there were so many visits that you shared with her at the nursing home. In the past week, Leslie, one of your last visits really is so important for everybody to know about. You were, you happened to be the one who was there, but the message she gave you was not just for you. In this past week, when she had trouble even opening her eyes, let alone communicate. She opened her eyes and she saw you there, and she was able to say to you, stick together. And you know what she meant? She meant all of you. Stick together. She got it. She understood that family needs family, and she wanted to make sure that you got that message to everybody, which you did. So today, friends, while we have broken hearts, we have to find a way to create grateful hearts as well. I'm grateful for this beautiful life. Today we join with the sages of our people as we declare Zichrona Livracha. We pray that the memory of Janet Kirsch and the good deeds that she performed here in the land of the living will always be for you a true blessing. Amen. We are taught from our tradition that words which come from the heart enter directly to the heart. We know that Laura has some words from her heart she wants to share with all of us, and I know Brian is going to come up and just be there to give her a little extra strength, so I invite you to come forward at this time.
you've heard lots of anecdotes and memories and funny stories and some of mom's quirks. You've heard about what an amazing homemaker she was and how much she loved her family and friends. For the last few weeks, she was declining, becoming completely unresponsive, sleeping a lot and eating very little. I arrived here last Tuesday, and since then, Brian, Leslie, and I took turns sitting with her all day and all night. On Saturday, around 1 o'clock, she opened her eyes wide, and she looked directly at me and Brian. We quickly started speaking, and she was responding by blinking. She couldn't speak or move, but each time we mentioned one of her grandchildren's names, she blinked her eyes. I told her we were all healthy and happy, which is all she really wanted. I was able to put Elroy and Omi and Emily on speakerphone and let them talk to her. She blinked her eyes and her face turned flush when she heard their voices. For close to three hours, we talked about fun family vacations, fond memories, and cherished times. Mom left us knowing, in no uncertain terms, she did exactly what she set out to do. She raised two great kids, <laughs> who then in turn raised two families, who we're so proud of. And we know that her love will live on in all of us. as we prepare for the rites of burial, I just want to share with everyone that the family will receive visitors from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. today only at the Kirsch residence at 12345 Summerwood Drive, which is in Concord or Painesville. Praised are you, Adonai, God, creator of the universe, the righteous judge. Adonai Natan, Adonai Lakach, Yehi Shem, Adonai Mevarach. God has given, now God has taken away. Still we bless the name of God. The dust returns to the earth as it was, but the spirit returns unto God who gave it. May the soul of Janet Kirsch be bound up in the bond of life eternal. 
We know that when we come into this world, there are loving hands to hold us and to guide us. And we're taught that when we exit from this world, it should not be done in the hands of strangers, but in the hands of those who knew us and who loved us. At this time, I invite first the immediate family and anyone else who wishes to place earth on the casket. At that time, if you're able, I'll ask you to remain standing for our closing prayers. We now continue with our closing prayers.
for anyone else who wishes to place earth, we will have a moment for you to do that after we say the Kaddish. O merciful God who dwells on high, who is full of compassion, grant perfect rest beneath the shelter of your divine presence among the holy and pure, who shine as the brightness of the firmament, and to our dear departed Jan, who has gone out to her eternal home. May her soul be bound up in the bonds of eternal life and grant that her memory inspire everyone who knows her to noble and consecrated living. And to this we say, Amen. Friends, we turn now to the words of the Kaddish and we recite together. Oh, you're only... Oh. 